Good evening, everybody, and welcome into the office here at Fellowship Bible Church. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and tune in and listen to a study of God's Word. God's Word is so good for us. It nourishes our souls. It lifts us. It encourages us. Sometimes it rebukes and corrects us, but it's what we need to hear. The truth of God's Word is powerful. So I'm so excited to be able to share with you tonight. Thank you again so much for being here. We're going to be continuing in our study of First Peter. So if you want to grab a Bible and open up with me to First Peter chapter 4, and we're going to pick up right where we left off the other day. We're going to be in verse 8. All right. So First Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, Lord willing tonight, taking it through verse 11. Once again, welcome, everybody. Let's bow before the Lord now and let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, most holy Lord God, thank you so much that we can have this time here tonight and this opportunity to read your word and to be encouraged and taught and instructed and, and just have our faith solidified and, and edified and built up by your word, by your spirit living in us, teaching each one of your children. Dear Lord God, I pray that what we read and hear tonight would be clear and and, and that we would receive it in faith, Lord God. I pray for all of my brothers and sisters in Christ that they would be encouraged and built up. I pray for anyone, Lord, who maybe has come in here tonight and is just curious or they're new and maybe they don't know you as Lord and Savior yet. Lord, I'm so thankful that that person's watching tonight. And I pray, Lord God, that you would use the teaching and speaking of your word to bring them to faith in you, our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, so much for this time now. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, as we have been going through First Peter, we know that it's a letter that is dealing with Christians who are going through hard times, various trials, right? And as we have gone through the letter, we've seen one of the great uh, emphases of the letter is the conduct of Christians as they are enduring hardships. And we've come to this point of the letter where he seems to be pushing towards his close, as he said in verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers, right? And we dealt with that on Sunday. So even as you're going through hardship, as you can see that the end is approaching when our Lord Jesus will return for us, first he speaks to their prayer. And they should be serious and watchful in their prayers. And that's what we dealt with on Sunday when we were preaching. And now we come to verse 8. Now he addresses their conduct. So you, you're going through hardship, various trials. You see that we are pressing towards the end when our Lord will appear and come back for us. Praise the Lord. What should you do? Here's how you should be in your prayer. Here's how you should be in your conduct. The conduct part of it is what we have before us tonight. So let me begin reading in verse 8 of 1 Peter chapter 4. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever Amen. And boy, just the fact that the passage ends with that amen, let it be so, just gives an added emphasis to the important of what the importance of what Peter is trying to convey to the children of God here in this passage. So let's kind of just pick this up and we'll take each one of these things that are listed here. There's just like basically four short sentences and each one of them brings out something for us. And we'll just take them one at a time. So the first thing he says here is, Above all things, have fervent love for one another. 
And then he quotes from Proverbs and says, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And that's a quotation of Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12. And I kind of got curious about uh, why it seems like he's only quoting half of a verse there. So I went back and, and looked up the rest of it. And it actually, what it says, the whole verse is, hatred stirs up strife, but love will cover a multitude of sins. And that's why he is... Uh, starting this sentence by saying, above all things, have fervent love for one another. Not just love one another, but I love the adjective fervent. The idea is passionate. Fervency speaks of the intensity of something. We should have a, a warm, intense love for one another. Why? Because of what love can do, in contrast to its uh, antithesis, which is hatred. Hatred just stirs up trouble and strife, and we don't need trouble and strife amongst ourselves. What we need is to be good ambassadors for the Lord, and the, the way to have that is to fervently, intensely, intensely love one another, because that won't stir up trouble. That'll do the opposite. It will cover a multitude of sins. I. This is... You know, one of those statements in the Bible that, especially as you read through the New Testament, the literature that is specifically came along just for the church. We, we read and, and care deeply about the Old Testament as well. But these New Testament letters, especially, that came along were directed at really emphasizing what is important in Christian doctrine and in Christian living. And when it comes to living as a Christian in this world, so many times you come across statements, you can't avoid it, they just keep coming back and back and back. These statements about love one another, love one another, love one another. And of course, if you sit and you listen to a preacher like me or, or any, any preacher who just loves to share the word of God, when they come to one of these statements about love, what they probably end up doing is taking you through a bunch of other statements about love because there's so many of them in the New Testament. I just want to read to you so you really get in you the importance of loving one another. Uh, just I had I kind of took the easy way out and printed out a list of statements here concerning love, starting in the Old Testament, but really emphasizing the things that are written in the letters of the New Testament. So I'll try to make minimum comments here. I just want you to listen to all of these things back to back to back. They're so eloquent. They're so powerful. Listen, because he says, above all things, love, fervent love for one another, above anything else, all things, most important thing, top of the list, as you see that Jesus is coming again, as you're going through hardship, man, above everything else, love one another fervently. Listen to this. First of all, from the law itself, in Leviticus 19, it says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And Peter himself had quoted from Proverbs, but from the great wisdom of Proverbs, here's another statement. Listen to this. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. Herbs there being uh, emblematic of a very humble dinner. The fatted calf uh, being indicative of a very sumptuous dinner. You're better off with the simple, humble dinner where there's love than with the grand and glorious feast where there's hatred. Just showing the importance of love. Now, coming into the New Testament, of course, Jesus said some magnificent things about loving one another to his disciples, all passed on down to us in the word of God. In John 13, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So our love for one another is a mark to everyone who observes us that we really belong to the Jesus that we proclaim and trust. Jesus went on simply to say, also in the Gospel of John, this is my commandment, 
that you love one another as I have loved you. Right? How did Jesus love us? Well, he gave that great example of how he washed his disciples' feet, but ultimately what he did was he laid down his life for our sins. Man, that's a high standard for love, but that's how we're called to love one another. The uh, same Apostle John who wrote those statements of Christ in the Gospel of John, here are a couple of statements from his letter that we call 1 John. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Children of God, children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. That's 1 John 3. Here's 1 John 4. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. How? That God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is, Jesus in his sacrifice satisfied the debt that was owed to God by bearing our sins. And then his, his conclusion is, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Here's a few of the sayings of Paul, just to make the point. This is one of my favorite sayings here. Romans 13, he says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. In the same passage, he says, Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul said, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may, listen to this, establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. In other words, our love for one another is one of the things that prepares us for Christ's return. Hallelujah. Uh, Paul writing in Colossians says, just two more here. Paul says, Therefore, as the elect of God, think of that privilege, right? We're not God's children because we were smart enough to figure him out. He saw us. He had mercy on us. And he chose us. We are the elect of God. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Pretty high call, right? Now listen. But, above all these things, as high as all that was, above all of that, above all of that, put on love. Listen to this, which is the bond of perfection, love. Well, I'd love to elaborate on all these, but we have other texts to get into here. Here's the last one, maybe the most famous thing of all about love in the Bible. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. 
is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, seeks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Convinced? Man, I hope so. Those are, those are some powerful statements about love and how we're called to love. And going back to what Peter said, he said what? In the context of knowing that the end of all things is at hand, above anything else, have fervent love for one another. How's your love for your brethren? Examine yourself. Pray to the Lord. Now, the next thing that he says is be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Now, the idea of hospitality, at least the English word, is that you see the word hospital there, and I've probably explained this before, but the idea of a hospital is a place to care for someone who is in need, even the need of sickness, right? Like we, we've fallen ill and, and there's a need for care. And the idea of hospitality is even to open up your own home and open up your own possessions and open up what you have in order to care for someone else who is suffering. That's, that's hospitality. Sometimes that manifests itself in, in just hosting someone in your house for a meal. Other times it may go beyond that. But, you know, I was thinking in light of the fact that in so much of the news of the day with the, the, uh, the COVID disease going around, we think a lot about hospitals and we think a lot about hospital workers and the, the amazing work that they do to try to care for other people, to bring them back. And I thought that's kind of a perfect illustration in a way of what Peter is talking about here. We are the hospital workers for each other's souls. We're the hospital workers for each other's spirits. We're the hospital workers for each other's faith. That's what it is to be hospitable to one another. Spiritual health. Look, and I know what you're thinking. God is the one that works in us. Amen. That's absolutely true. But in so many instances, and you know this if you've been in Christ for any length of time, the way that God often works is by using his children to be his own hands, to be his own mouth, to be his own feet. We are the hospital workers for one another. And sometimes as brothers and sisters, we get sick. And our hospitality to one another strengthens the soul, the spirit, the faith of one another. And it is God who uses that and does that. So be attentive to that as well. So first we saw the fervent love for one another. Now there's one more comment to make here about hospitality because the thing that I think makes this statement powerful is the last two words. It's not just be hospitable to one another, is it? It's be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Right? The fact that he doesn't elaborate on the being hospitable very much is almost an indication, I think, that it's, it's a given. It's taken for granted that Christians will be hospitable to one another. But the key that really makes this statement pop out is be hospitable without grumbling. The idea of grumbling is complaining. In other words, oh, I need to care for this person again. Oh, won't this person just like get over, grow up, whatever, you know? And the idea is our hospitality, our care for one another should be without complaining. You can see how love and hospitality overlap and feed one another, right? But our hospitality should be done without grumbling. Our hospitality should be offered with eagerness, with enthusiasm, with joy. Listen, when we get to show hospitality to a brother or sister, we have an opportunity to serve God by lifting the spirit, the countenance, the heart of that person. So do it without complaining. Do it without grumbling. Do it as a divine blessing of an opportunity that God has given to you. And then the next thing that he goes on to say is, verse in verse 10, as each one has received a gift minister it to one another 
as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Oh, I love this statement because so many times, you know, people will come to me and will say, you know, Pastor Lou, how can I know what my gift from God is? And what we'll do sometimes is we'll, we'll read the passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 12, or we'll read the passage of Scripture in Romans 12, where it talks about the gift of the Spirit, and we try to, like, kind of kind of slot ourselves into one of those things somewhere. And that's useful, and that's good. But you see this phrase here where he talks about being good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That word manifold, what it means is uh, it, it refers to a wide variety. In other words, God's grace here, uh, here not talking about God's saving grace, but talking about the gifts that he gives to his children to use to serve. There's a wide variety of things. In other words, like anything, whatever good that we have or whatever good that we can possibly do, it's all from God. God gives us these opportunities to do good to one another. These are his gifts. I have an opportunity to, to minister here means to serve. I have an opportunity to minister to my brother and sister, minister to one another using the gifts, any good, any opportunity for good that God gives you to do within the body of Christ. Do it as a good steward. What is a steward? A steward is someone who holds something and employs, uses something, being trusted by the owner of it, right? In other words, my ability to do this or that that God gives me really isn't mine. It's his, and he gave it to me, and as a good steward, recognizing, in other words, that it belongs to God, it's from God, I employ it in his service, right? So what's your gift from the Lord? Listen, as the Holy Spirit works in you, as you walk closely with God, certainly any good, any service, any helpfulness, any compassion, any good thing that he gives you the opportunity and the capacity to perform towards one of his own children, that is grace and good gift from God. And as a good steward, use it. Use it for the glory of God. As each one has received a gift, that's you. If you're in Christ, that banner of each one, you're under it. As each one of us has received a gift, minister it, serve with it, one another in the body of Christ. As you see, the end is approaching, right? The end of all things is at hand. Use those gifts, those gifts, Serve, those things that God has given you the ability to serve with, the manifold grace of God. Use it, use it, use it, and bring great glory to God. Then the next thing, look at this. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God, right? And the idea of the oracles of God is, in other words, if you're going to speak, use your speech. If you've, if you've been gifted with the ability to speak, and and perhaps what Peter has in mind are those who are maybe specially gifted to speak in like a church context, but but it doesn't really say that per se. It's it's kind of like talking generally, I think, to every believer, because obviously every one of us can talk, right? So if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, look, when you speak, if God gives you that opportunity to speak on his behalf, don't waste your words. Don't waste your time with nonsense or endless fables or earthly philosophies, excessive jesting. And that's those things are not even to mention the whole host of like sinfulness that we can do with our words and with our mouths. Don't waste your time. If you're going to speak, speak as if God is speaking. Speak on behalf of God. Speak the word of God. Speak the truth of God. And this isn't like a cosmic mystical thing like, you know, I speak and it does this or that. No. If I'm going to speak, speak in service to God. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. My words have the capacity to build up and edify. They have the capacity to tear down and to destroy. Listen, our words, our words serve someone, all of them. Every word you speak, every word you post, every word you write, someone is served by it. That one who is served can be God, if you listen to what Peter has to say here and be a doer of what Peter says. Put it into practice. Use your words to glorify God. If anyone speaks, speak as the oracles of God. 
And then the last statement here then is he wraps all of this up with this summative statement by saying, if anyone ministers, that is generally, if anyone serves in anything, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The key is this last phrase, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever Amen. And so what he's saying here is, whatever you're going to do, do it with that ability that God supplies. So you got to walk closely with the Lord. You have to pray. You have to have his word swimming in your mind, med meditating on his truth, filled up with his love and with his power, just armed with that eagerness and that zeal to serve God. And then whatever he opens the door for you to do, do it with that ability that God supplies so that what? Look at this. So that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Who are we? Look, we belong to Jesus, right? We are the servants of Jesus the Messiah. And Jesus the Messiah is the Son of God. So as we serve our Lord Jesus, God, his Father and our Father, is being glorified, that is, he's being exalted, he is being lifted up. And why is that important? Why is that important? Because of this last statement. Because that glory, what? Belongs to him, right? God is the rightful owner of the glory that is derived from the conduct of his children. When our conduct is aimless, as it says earlier in the letter, God is being robbed of glory that he deserves. That's what we're left here to do, brothers and sisters, is use our time, redeem the time, use your gifts, use your opportunities to serve Jesus Christ and bring glory to God the Father. And that's not all he says, right? To whom belongs glory and what else? And the dominion. What is dominion? Dominion is rule over something. Sovereign rule. That is to say, the Lord Jesus is not only our Savior, He is our sovereign ruler. And so we should be obeying the things that He says. And that glory and that dominion doesn't just belong to Him when it's convenient for us. It belongs to Him, what? Forever and ever. Amen. So what's the bottom line to all this? The end of all things is at hand. Uh, serious and watchful in your prayers, and then as we discussed tonight, what? Have fervent love for one another, be hospitable without grumbling, be a good steward of God's gifts by using them for his service, and speak as if God is speaking through you. Use your words to serve him. And in all things, remember, the glory belongs to him, and we are part of his dominion forever and ever. Amen. I hope that's a blessing to you. It certainly is an encouragement and a rebuke and, and teaching for myself. If you're watching this tonight and you're listening to these things, I just want you to know that, th that there's nothing that I'm discussing here that is like, you have to do this in order to be a Christian. Don't think that because that's backwards and it's wrong. You need to become a Christian through humbling yourself and in repentance acknowledging your sinfulness humbly before God and coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died to pay the price for your sins. That's his love. We read that in one of the verses before. And he rose from the dead and he is alive forevermore. And if you will simply trust him, listen, put your faith in Jesus, receive Jesus by faith, by God's grace, in other words, not any works of your own, not any merit of your own, simply by God's love for you, God's goodness to you, which originates entirely in himself, God will save you from your sins. He will adopt you as his own child. His Holy Spirit will come into you and you will be sealed forevermore as a child of God. Then... Once by his grace through faith you have been saved, then you look at 
passages of scripture like this that are addressed to Christians and you say, yes, Lord, strengthen me, help me to glorify you by being obedient to these things. Come to Jesus. If you need to come to Jesus, come to Jesus by faith. Come to him, receive him. As many as come to him, he will in no way cast aside. Come to Jesus humbly by faith and be saved. And for those of us who have experienced that salvation already, let's be attentive to do what his word says because we're under his dominion and all the glory that he gets from it belongs to him. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, so much for your word, which we've been able to read and study tonight. And I pray for everyone who's watching this and listening. Thank you, God, so much for each one. Lord, how I pray that you would help us to receive your word tonight by faith and be doers of it and not hearers only. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming and spending the time doing this tonight. It's such an encouragement to me, and I hope it's something that's good for you as well. Well, God's word is always good for all of us, right? Well, listen, we have uh, our Sunday morning service coming up at uh, 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. It'll be right here. Uh, feel free to drop on over to our Facebook page and join us, would you? Thank you so much for being here, everybody. God bless you, and good night.